first speaker is uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar. Uh, he's, go he's going to talk about momentum imaging of ions in dissociative electron attachment. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for giving an opportunity to present some of our result, recent results here. So I'll be talking about momentum imaging of ions in dissociative electron attachment. So the plan of the talk is the following. I will give a brief introduction to momentum imaging techniques and deal with some of these uh, molecules, starting with carbon monoxide, chlorine, ozone, acetone, and acetaldehyde. And if time permits, I will talk about uh, functional group effects in propylamine. So how do we, the question is, the dissociative attachment process it is now known as one of the most important process in most of the physical phenomena happening in, in the, uh, you can say the universe at the low energies. So starting with, uh, it has applications starting with uh, chemical control to radiation damage, nanolithography, and various other processes. But this most Im fundamental point of view, it is very, very interesting and intricate phenomena dealing with the coupling between the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom of a molecule, not only in the bound state, but in the continuum as well. So this process, studying this process itself have become very interesting. So it can be studied by mass spectra, different types of ions which are produced in the DEA process, the ion yield curves, the negative ion which are the produced as a function of electron energy we can study to measure the absolute cross-section for this process. And of course, we can do momentum imaging to look at the structure and dynamics of the resonances which takes part in this dissociative attachment process as well as the, the how the process occurs. This, those details we can get. I'm, I must apologize. I'm not, uh, I didn't give any brief introduction to the uh, dissociative electron attachment process because yesterday there was a nice talk by Professor Odoring Goldson on this process. And he was also dealing with the momentum imaging technique. So I, in order to save time, I now go into the details. So I straight away go to the velocity slice imaging technique, which, which was developed first in 10 years back at TIFR Mumbai. And uh, the process is the following. Of course, photo, velocity slice imaging is a known process in photo dissociation uh, uh, physics or photo dissociation uh, science. So the idea is that you have, a, in this case, in the, with the electron, what we do is we have a pulsed low energy electron interacting with an FUC electron beam at this point here. And after the electron beam goes away, with a certain delay, after a certain delay, we put in an extraction, pulse extraction field in this direction, pushing the ions towards a two dimensional position sensitive detector. The heart of this time of flight arrangement is a lens, electrostatic lens sitting, situated here, which controls the velocity slice, velocity mapping or velocity slicing in this case. So what we need to do is here is that uh, the, for the velocity mapping, the ions in the finite volume, which are rejected in any direction, are mapped onto a point in the detector depending irrespective of the position, but only for ions of a given velocity are mapped onto the point here. So you get a Newton sphere revolving onto the detector. You can see the time of flight we are showing the schematic. And as it strikes the detector, you get a time of flight spectrum for a given ion. Ideally, this should be symmetric, but the slight asymmetry doesn't bother us so much. What we are interested is in the central slice shown here, which essentially is in the uh, it's a slice of the Newton sphere, contain, which contains the electron beam direction. So if you take the central slice and look at the intensity as a function of position, what you get is the velocity slice image. So this is the example from O minus from O2. You can, this is the details of the technique which we developed. You have basically, you have a three elements electron gun, which can be pulsed. It is put in a magnetic field to collimate the electron beam. And you have the time of flight with the position sensitive detector. So this has been modified later on, which I made, built at Open University using a uh, uh, instead of uh, a wedge and strip uh, uh, readout, which are used for the position readout, we use a phosphor screen with a pulse 
uh, detection. So we can slice the image using the applying the bias in the form of a narrow pulse. Now after this experiments where we built, there have been several experiments now the world over, the TFR Mumbai which we built, there is soon after there was one at LBNL in USA, the Open University in UK, HEFA in China, Auburn University in USA, one in ISR Kolkata and recently and MPI Heidelberg, there is a poster in uh, yesterday it was there in, the, in this conference. So there are varieties of, I mean there are many instruments running now, so what are, in, what are the now these instruments have come up with some of the molecule with slight variation in the final results which some of them I would like to touch upon in this, in this uh, uh, talk if possible. So what are the crucial aspects is in this is the electron energy spread, the contributing factors to imaging resolution, the electron energy spread, the angular resolution. In all these experiments we use a magnetic field to conf either to confine the electron beam also moreover more than that. This in the DEA process what is what you have is a huge number of secondary electrons coming out and coming we are looking at the detecting the negative ions. So they can come and strike the detector and give a huge amount of noise. So this magnetic field in a way helps in controlling this uh, again the, the scattered electrons. So it also depends on the slicing accuracy of the polar effects. So the Oban group showed that uh, instead of uh, direct slicing in the form of a rectangular pulse, if you can slice it in the form of a wedge in a, in so which slicing in terms of the angle, you have a better accuracy especially in the polar, polar regions and we don't need to worry about the background contributions. And there we have, we have re realized recently there are unqualified effects due to stray magnetic fields and degradation of the, due to degradation of the material which have been used for the experiments. So let me straight away go into some of the examples, carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide, the angular distribution of O minus coming out of this process, these two processes have been studied by Hall in, uh, in the early, late 70s in uh, Paris. And uh, what they showed are the two processes and which, uh, which have got angular distribution mostly O minus being ejected in the forward, backward direction. So this is the resonance which is peaking around a 10 EV with a sharp onset with a slow uh, decay for the O minus yield curve. Now these are the momentum images O minus you can see the two, two thresholds for sing, triplet P and singlet D initially you have only singlet P and the triplet P then you can see the singlet D evolving here. You can also see this third one over here 12.3 V in the form of a small blob here at the higher energies. So this angular distribution can be fitted based on the formula which was worked out by O'Malley and Taylor in 1968. So what you have is the intensity as a function of angle, you have uh, the spherical harmonics and uh, some coefficients which depends on the uh, function of the projection of the. Uh, rather mu which is a difference in the projection of the orbital angular momentum around the principal axis of the molecule and the partial wave the L partial wave the L the angular momentum of the uh, electron partial. And, and of course if you write down this uh, there are specific condition which comes out like for example if you take a homonuclear diatomic molecules you see that L has to be only odd or even for a homonuclear diatomics but L could be any number in the case of a heteronuclear diatomic molecule and L will be greater than or equal to mu and the various values of L's are possible. So when we fit this angular distribution okay here these are the angular distribution which we measure from full 0 to 360 I am showing it is not necessary only up to 180 is enough I am showing it to show the how well the both sides are uh, the imaging quality how well it matches. So these are the results which are hard at all and these are our results here and similarly this is for the triplet P channel and this is for the singlet D channel, this blue ones are our present, our, I'm sorry red ones are our data and the blue ones are hard at all, there is a slight deviation from that. But this angular distribution eventually we could fit using the O'Malley Taylor formalism to with a, if you can uh, take into account a pi state and sigma state as, a, as a resonances with a L equal to 1 in this case and L equal to 0 and 1 in this case. For both these states we could fit with a pi and a sigma states. But there have been recently this, 
this work this data which i have measured in 2010 i did i haven't had an opportunity to publish it because so there are more important things we had we are after but recently recently there have been publication you see one from the chinese group and one from my former colleague from kolkata in kolkata who is now in kolkata so there have been a controversy regarding this uh, angular distribution of the o minus coming out the hifi group showed that there is hardly there is no intensity in the forward direction for o minus at all and this they interpreted in terms of a a coherent excitation of several resonances not just uh, 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 incoherent sum of uh, two or three resonances which generally which gen hall had used and what we found which fits the data very well if you don't have any forward going signal it has to be uh, interpreted in terms of a, they showed that it has to be interpreted in terms of a coherent excitation of more, uh, more than one resonance but the kolkata group showed that there is indeed there is a small intensity in the forward direction as shown here in our data there is indeed a final there is a forward intensity in the forward direction as can be seen from here in this small lobe in this both directions so the question is is there any in the forward uh, is there any intensity in the forward direction it is unequivocally decided in favor that there is indeed uh, intensity in the forward direction so we don't have to invo in, uh, invoke a coherent excitation of resonances in this case let me go to some measurements on cl2 which we did recently so there has been a measurement on the absolute cross section by kurepa and belik on cl minus from cl2 by the way cl2 is a very important molecule from plasma etching point of view and there have been lot of theoretical and experimental studies carried out particularly with the low energy in the low energy zero ev region where uh, 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 there have been several work including theoretical work by ilia fabricant and uh, experimental high resolution electron attached one work by hotop and uh, his group colleagues and what they found uh, basically there are four resonances the zero energy resonance is due to a doublet sigma u and uh, this particular peak is due to a doublet pi g a doublet pi u and there is a small resonance due to a doublet sigma g plus that's these are the theoretical calculations four resonances you can see and this particular sigma u which is which will be talking about more in this uh it cuts this uh, neutral curve right at this equilibrium uh, position and this seems to be the main this have been uh, explained the main reason why you have a zero energy ele electron attachment peak in the for the uh, cl minus channel but what we found is okay when we did the measurement we also measured the ion yield curve in the cl minus we see the we didn't go below 1 ev we see peak at uh, this peak and this peak we are able to see even this tiny peak we are able to see uh, in this region over here but when you look at the angular distribution what we find is so this is a 2.5 ev the cl minus the electron beam is coming in this direction you can see that this ring is not very clean there is a very, very strong intensity outer ring and there is a faint inner ring that is due to this faint inner ring is due to the cl chlorine 37 isotope which comes a little a little uh, a little later in the time of flight spectrum as compared to cl35 so that when you do the slicing some contribution from that is uh, seen here but that we can eliminate by taking only the outer ring in our angular distribution uh, uh, analysis so when we analyze the data what we see is that this can be this can be interpreted only in terms of if you if you include both the pi g and sigma u states so you can see the contribution of sigma u is can be clearly seen the finite intensity in the forward and backward direction in the two polar regions so you know in order to explain this finite intensity we had to introduce the sigma u state now we can analyze these this, this uh, images at higher energies again this is due to dominated by a pi u resonance here as shown here a small contribution from uh, sigma g which may be there which may not be there it may be due to the noise which we are not very clear but uh, sigma j in any case it is uh, very weak over here go to higher energy we have again a strong sigma g and pi u contributions so in this we have both pi u and sigma g uh, contributing so if we separate these out contributions in the two resonances 
in terms of various resonance, uh, sigma st resonance state, what we find is in this peak there is a pi u and sigma u contributions. And in this case, I'm sorry, it should be pi g here, pi g and sigma u contribution. And here there is a pi u, pi u and uh, sigma g contributions. We are a little puzzled by this contribution for sigma u at the low energy peak because that is supposed to be contributing only to the zero EV resonance. How, and how it is coming at this high energy or is it a different resonance, sigma resonance which is contributing to this? We cannot clearly uh, explain that right now. But the contribution of these two resonances, sigma g and pi u in this same peak can be explained in terms of the potential energy curve that they, both the potential energy curve come very close so we can have and also considering the finite width of the resonance, we can explain uh, the contribution, these two contributions very well. Let me go to the ozone. I'm running a short of time. Uh, here we have a, what we are talking about, uh, again, O minus and O2 minus formation from ozone. Uh, this has been studied in terms of absolute cross sections uh, by our group earlier, quite some time back. And uh, these are, you can see the peak at uh, low energies and there are it's, it's some structure and there is a uh, high energy peak in O minus channel. Similarly, there is resonance peaks, at least three peaks clearly we can see in, in this, in the O2 minus channel. So what you notice here is that O minus seems to be ejected mostly in the backward direction. The electron beam is coming in this direction and O2 minus is in the forward direction mostly ejected in the forward direction. So if you look at the qualitative features of the momentum distributions, so O3 is uh, C2V, molecule of C2V symmetry in the ground state is singular to A1, it's about an angle of 170 degrees. So all the images show two body fragmentation. It shows that there is not, uh, other, I mean clear rings show that it's a two body type fragmentation with a uh, distinct angular distribution, so that is a, uh, there is no doubt that it's O minus and O2 are the, or O2 and O2 minus and O are the two, uh, are the uh, only possible channels. See, so forward and the forward and backward ejection of the fragment shows that the electron is approaching along the principal axis. That is, it seems to be coming preferentially in this direction with oxygen atom facing the, uh, central oxygen atom facing the electron. And so, it's so show, it, it also shows that the O2 is essentially formed by these two end atoms in O2 minus or O2. In both cases, it is formed by the end atoms. So when we look at the angular distributions, what we find is the following. At the two EV resonance, the top figure on the left hand side, uh, this doesn't seem to be working very well. It shows that it's a B2 resonance. And uh, you can see that 2.7 uh, O2 uh, minus data also shows it is a 2.75 EV shows a B2 resonance. And the only calculation which have been carried out by the bond group has identified this as an A1 resonance. But our data clearly shows it is a B2 resonance. And as we increase in energy, what we find is that the bottom uh, two figures, what it shows is that uh, it's a combination of B2 and A1 resonance come into picture. Now, if you go higher up in energy, we don't, we cannot clearly demarcate the O minus. We cannot see O minus uh, clearly from in the momentum image or even iron yield curve because when you put in ozone, there is always a lot of O2 being produced through uh, dissociation of ozone in the experimental chamber. So we cannot make measurements on O minus from ozone. It will be contaminated by O minus from O2. But we had done from O2 minus formation, I'm sorry. So that is what it shows here and here again, it's the main contribution contributing from uh, A1 resonance and some contribution, small contribution from B2. So what it shows is that at the lowest energy, it's a B2 is dominating. As we go up in energy, there's a contribution A1 comes in and the highest energy A1 seems to be uh, dominating in the resonance process. So when you, the, if you look at again, the kinetic energies of these ions, O minus and O2 minus, and calculate the total kinetic energy release, which we have plotted as a function of electron energy here. You can see that uh, this is red is from the, uh, derived from the O minus data and the black ones are derived from the O2 minus data. You can see there is a, a flat, slow rising thing as compared to what is, the straight lines are what you expect 
if there is a pure two body dissociation without any internal excitation of the O2 or O2 minus. Well, in the case of O2 minus, we see there is a slight low energy, then there is an increase, and there again it uh, sort of follows the same pattern like this. Based on this, this part, we can say that, of course, we said the electron is to approach along this direction. That was the, that based on which we had calculated all the angular distribution and fitted it. And uh, also, we can see that uh, with low electron energies, O2 minus and O2 are formed in the low vibrational states. And with the increasing energy, you can see the it should ideally the kinetic energy release should have been going this way. But with the increasing energy, this most of the excess energy is going to the vibrational excitation of the O2 or O2 minus channels. So what it means is that at low energies, it seems that uh, as the electron has come attached, the dissociation happens in slowly such that there is enough energy in the system to uh, the o by the time O minus has gone out, the O2 minus two atoms have come, for, come together and uh, uh, form uh, O2 or O2 minus with uh, in the uh, relatively low vibrational states because it's a slow process. But as the electron energy increases, the dissociation process becomes faster. As a result, the O minus is going, this, this bonds are broken very fast, so O minus is ejected. That leaves the two end atom with the far, at a larger internuclear separation, thereby leading to the formation of O2 or O2 minus in vibrationally excited states. So there are no, this again we see that for every half EV change in electron energy, we can have seen typically about two vibrational levels excitation, we can see that sort of thing we can see. And there is no large distribution of vibrational uh, distribution which we see in the O minus or O2 image, they are confined to very relatively small uh, region. So then in conclusion, we feel that by, by based on the momentum imaging, we are able to understand the symmetry of the resonance which takes part in the electron attachment to O3 as well as the dynamics of the O3 minus uh, dissociation. I have last five minutes now, I will go to uh, uh, story of this acetaldehyde and acetone. What have, the question we are addressing is what happens if we replace the hydrogen atom in acetaldehyde? So it is 3H3, C, H and O. So you remove the hydrogen with, uh, to the carbon and put another methyl group. So CH3, CO, CH3. And what happens to the DEA process? So with the OU, from the OU we have uh, measured the acetaldehyde. We can see what we are going to look at is the O minus channel. In this O minus and OH minus, we cannot separate out due to finite mass resolution. But it's dominated by the O minus. In this case, here again, we cannot separate out between CH3 minus, O minus, and OH minus. But CH3 minus is very small, and OH minus also relatively small as compared to O minus. So we are confining this, uh, uh, all this discussion to assuming it is all O minus being produced. So when we look at this uh, angular momentum images from uh, acetone, you can see what you see is as a function of electron energy, if you scan across. We scan across the uh, resonance. What we see is a, start with a, a blob with uh, hardly any discernible uh, uh, distribution. But as we increase the electron energy, we can see clearly uh, distribution arising. Not only that, there is a two dissociation channel, one with a central uh, with a low kinetic energy shows a three body fragmentation. But there is a distinct uh, momentum distribution, finite kinetic energy, and that shows the O minus channel. So this has been discussed in this paper. And uh, when we do acetone and look at the O minus, this O minus coming out, what we see is a, a, a blob with a relatively large size, but it's keeping increasing size. But uh, there is no uh, distinct structure in this. So what it shows is that this replacing the hydrogen atom by a methyl group seems to be changing the resonant character, at least in the DEA channel, drastically. So we did some calculations. Based on this technique, which uh, my uh, colleague from BRC, Sajiv, had developed. So, we use this technique to calculate the uh, uh, resonance states for acetone and acetaldehyde, which shows that this, in the case of acetone, what we found is ended up as a shape resonance 
whereas in acetaldehyde it turned out to be a, a feshbach excited, valence excited, feshbach resonance. And this here you can see from the, the, the way the uh, electron density is uh, distributed, it, this uh, acetone breaks into uh, H2, uh, aline and uh, 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 CO, I'm sorry O minus, I'm sorry O minus H2 and aline. And uh, here in this case what you're getting is O minus, it's uh, only a two body fragmentation giving rise to O minus. Lastly, I just touch upon uh, the functional group dependence in site select and site selectivity in DEA. This we had talked about much earlier. Uh, we had shown that uh, the electron attachment or the DEA characteristics seen in water, methane and ammonia can be seen in the bigger organic molecule containing OH, o o OH or CH or NH uh, sites. So, we look, uh, try to investigate this in the case of uh, an amine. So, I am comparing the am ammonia data. These are again uh, old published data. H minus coming out at from the 5.5 E resonance and H minus at 10.5 E resonance at this point. And of course, we see an H2 minus. And uh, you will see that uh, yesterday there was a poster from the Heidelberg group where they could have a much better resolution in this NH2 minus because instead of 0.5 EV resolution which we have, they had 0.2 EV using a 0.2 EV resolution which they obtained using a photocathode. So, you should pay attention to that which again shows an in, so something like an inverted uh, image of this. Anyway, coming to this uh, again uh, before going to uh, uh, the uh, functional group, let me also show you the what happens to the methane. In the case of methane, we again H minus, these are resonance H minus and CH2 minus channels and you can see the CH, this resonance here decays through, uh, there are outer ring and mostly at higher energy what you see here is a three body fragmentation which leads to the CH2 minus formation. And when you compare this with a propel amine, so you can see that this is H minus coming from this at this resonance which is very similar to what you see from ammonia and H minus coming at the higher energy resonance which is very similar to what is seen in the uh, methane. So, let me conclude now just by talking about where do we go from here. So, what we need is improved energy resolution. The correct step is been shown by the Heidelberg group, group that we should maybe go for a photocathode sort of system where we can get a reasonably good current, electron current, pulse electron current with a high energy resolution. We have been trying with a, a trochoidal monochromator, but that always found out, we found out that it is not able to give enough current in a pulse mode. What I also find that there are, now there are several groups working on this technique and there may be more groups coming into picture soon. So, but what we need to do is sort of a discuss with each other and sort of standardize this uh, technique and find out what are the problems and try to solve it so that we come up with a very common, uh, uh, you know, experimental, uh, standardized experimental technique. In this context, I might just add that uh, we are calling a meeting, we are going to hold a meeting in November in Mumbai, November 18th to 20th under the DEA club. It is an international work workshop on DEA and related aspects. If any of you who are interested in that, please write to me to, uh, in that context. So, we are going to have a meeting where we hopefully discuss these aspects. We, the another aspect which we would like to look at is measurement of biological uh, uh, molecules. Again, the, the LBNL group I believe has made a beginning in, uh, in this context. One of the important thing which we are trying to do and which we have been trying for a while is measurements of radicals and excited states. We hope to take it up. Uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Prabhudesha is working very, uh, uh, very uh, putting lot of efforts in these directions. And most importantly, when we get all these momentum images which are very complex and which contains lot of information, what we need to understand that what we need is either theoretical calculation which we find very sorely uh, really needed. So, let me conclude by acknowledging my uh, colleagues, uh, Vaibhav Prabhudesha he is here, Bhar Dr. Bhagavaram, he was one of my students who worked with uh, the n propel amine and ammonia and methane. 
Dhananjay Nandi, who was my student, who has now set up a new lab in Kolkata on this technique. Krishnendu Gobe is a student who is here. Vishwesh Tathar, another student. Sanath is a student. Dali is a postdoc who did the calculation for us. And of course, my European collaborators here, Nigel Mason, Evelina, Freeman, Odor, Stephen, Isdok. And of course, when I was there at OU on a Marie Curie Fellowship. And these green ones are my colleagues from uh, BARC who helped in the data acquisition system. Thank you for your attention. Sorry.